from the sidelines. We gotta hustle because we gotta eat. What up, what up? This is Drew Lieberman, and welcome to the Sideline Hustle Week 6 update. This is where we're going to give you guys an inside look into the NFL through my eyes, through the eyes of my clients, some of the top NFL receivers and tight ends in the business. Uh, starting off at week seven right now, it's Thursday night, going into week seven, National Tight Ends Day. Our boy Evan Ingram is playing the New Orleans Saints tonight at 8 p.m. Uh, very excited for that. We're going to get into how our week of preparation changed a little bit uh, with Evan going into a short week and, and, and talk, give you guys some insight on some of those adjustments. But I want to start off with week six. Uh, he had seven catches for 41 yards against the Colts this week. Had a big win, third win in a row for the Jaguars. They're they're playing really good team football right now. Um, and for Ev, he had you know he had seven catches. He's leading all tight ends in catches. He tied with Travis Kelsey and uh, and Hawkinson for for catches. I think he's leading the league in yak for tight ends. He's like third or fourth in yards, and he's had he's had a great year. His catch percentage is is really high, which is something I look at a lot. He, the and the types of catches he's making are great. Like he is filling his role. And you know you got you got Christian Kirk, Calvin Ridley, Zay Jones on the edge. Evan is really the guy that has to be old reliable in the middle. He has to control the middle. He has to be a safety blanket for Trev. He's got to make the tough catches. And most of all, he's got to be a guy who can turn these simple underneath throws into big plays, which I think is Evan is doing better than anybody, just about anybody in football right now. It's something we pride ourselves a lot on is, is from a guy who's been inconsistent with his hands and had inconsistencies in his game. Overall, just being that reliable safety blanket, I think is a really important thing for, for him and for Trevor. And then, you know, turning small plays into big plays is a huge thing for the team. Uh, for us and our goals, like we just want a, a more downfield opportunities, and we want to just capitalize on those opportunities. Like the reality is, Kirk, you know, Zay Jones, Calvin Ridley, they're gonna be the downfield guys. They're gonna be the e intermediate ball guys. That's what that's what their skill set, you know, allows them to do. But but Evan still gets some of those opportunities. They're a little less frequent, so he's got to take more advantage of them. He's got to be more locked into the details. And we just really got to capitalize on those plays. And then we'll see his yards per catch start to rise. His yards start to rise. And I really think that a lot of what Evan's doing is. He's playing as well as, as any player at the position right now. Um, and I think the numbers are going to continue to speak to that the more he becomes, you know, well-rounded and the more the offense continues to grow uh, with him playing this well. Um, but, but going to his game Sunday, uh, seven catches, 41 yards, a big win. The fun part about this one, this is like a side quest game for Evan. Uh, two things that he talked about wanting to do a lot in his, in his career is just like, you know, personal fun goals was make a sick one-hand catch and hurdle a guy in the open field. And he did both of those within like three or four plays of each other. Uh, this first play right here was uh, a cover two goal ball uh, on Julian Brents, a rookie corner who I have a lot of respect for. Really good, really good player, fun kid to study. But Ev took a great patient release, you know, attacked the spot we wanted to get to versus Brents right at the right tempo, earned the free cover two release, and he's running full speed at that whole shot. He sees the safety coming at him. He sees the, the ball to his outside shoulder. And just with the late reaction to the football, it was really the only way to catch this thing was one-handed, fully outstretched. You know, you can see it from this back view really well here. Great ball here from Trev in, in, the, in the hole shot, in the cover two window. And Ev goes up to gets it. You, you're, fading, you're turning to the ball last second, which is what we coach on back shoulders. But really just look at the extension. Look at his eyes to the ball, eyes glued to the football all the way through, seeing it, and then getting it tucked and protected quickly. And honestly, if I told you how much we practice these one-hand catches, you'd, you'd laugh at me. Uh, Evan kept, pulls them out a lot in training. Like, he put, makes a lot of unnecessarily spectacular catches, what I'll call them. Like, because I, when he told me this was one of his, like, side quests, I was like, come on, Ev. Like, we got bigger things to worry about. We just overcame, you know, you having a drop problem for years. But it's great to see the confidence. You know what I'm saying? Like, how, what, a, what a cool thing that speaks to the confidence, the way his confidence has grown to where he was – Literally at a point where he was catching everything close to his body, like, like you know, not having any confidence at the catch point, to being so confident that he can say one of his kind of side goals is to make a spectacular one-hand catch, and you see him do it. And for me, I wasn't surprised because he does it all the time in training, no matter, no matter how much I get on him about it. But it was, it was, uh, it was cool to see him talk about it and, and bring it to fruition and, and really make it happen. And, and it's something we drill fundamentally where, you know, we pride ourselves on being ball stoppers, that when the ball touches our hands, the ball stops and we have full control of it. So part of one of those drills we'll do is, is stationary one-hand catches where we're not just letting the ball kind of drift beyond us. We're being aggressive and stopping the football with one hand gives us an added ball control. And then, like I said, you know, you can kind of see here the ball stopping when it touches his hand. You see his, uh, you see his eyes glued to the ball. But like I said, Evan just pulls these out a lot in practice on his own because he, he has fun with it. And, and it's just a fun thing to be a part of. And then three plays later, he runs a shallow cross on like third and 13, beats the corner on the release, and has, you know, hurdles a guy in the open field. And I think when you watch the fundamentals of this play, something we talk about a lot is full speed yak. We talk about full catching the ball at full speed, 
fearlessly at full speed, right? Not slowing down at the catch point. And then if you do have to slow down for the ball, getting to full speed right away. So this one, he catches it at full speed, stays at full speed. And we have con- we do drills where you go full speed yak to you make a cut. You might juke a guy. We've even practiced the spin move a little bit with which one of our other clients, Darius Slayton, hit last week. We'll talk about later in the show. We've never really talked about the full speed catch to the hurdle. We've never drilled it at least. Evan has talked about that being a goal of his. And again, it's just funny how a, when a guy that good puts something in his mind, and is it at, at, at the level of peace that Evan is at in his game, he can make himself do anything on the football field. The game is slow to him. So that, that to me, like, you know, they ended up punting on this drive. So it's not even like it resulted in anything game changing. But to me, it spoke to, to Evan's confidence. The fact that the game is slow enough for him right now that he's able to catch the ball and do some of these things that he's always dreamed of doing because, like, football should be fun. And if he wants to make flashy, cool plays, like, that's that's part of the game. I mean, I was sitting in the stands, and there was a kid behind me like, oh, my God, Dad, this kid is incredible. And it was a cool moment for me of, like, really just, like, you know, Evan's my boy. Like, that's my dog. And I was just like, wow, like, this dude is a superhero to a lot of these guys. He's, he's superhuman to a lot of these fans. And, like, what a cool moment to Ev just to, to flash his talent and really just show how spectacular he can be. Um, and I think that ability is going to, you know, manifest itself in more and more game-changing plays. But definitely something fun to be a part of. Uh, something fun to see Evan, you know, get to accomplish. And he was really proud of, of being able to do that. And most importantly, we got the win. And most importantly, Evan did his job, you know, controlling the middle, making some big catches, some big third-down conversions. So uh, definitely cool to see them win three in a row. And now we're onto a short week, right? So so normally, you know, you, we have a whole week to prepare. Sunday night, you kind of enjoy the fruits of your labor, Monday, we might get on the field and do some off some, some field work and keep things sharp, catch the football. Tuesday is a, is a recovery day. And then, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you've got different themes of preparation for each day. Well, now you're playing on Thursday. We didn't have time to really rest, recover, enjoy any of it. Uh, Sunday night, we, you know, we, we watched the film together. We did some self-scout work. We analyzed his game. We, we fixed some, some little holes. And then right away, Monday morning, you know, there's no like, taking a deep breath we're right away onto the new orleans saints um and, and we're right away onto onto getting prepared for the different situations like i said normally during a, a longer week you we would have one day for each theme so a whole day focused on first and second down a whole day focused on third down uh, a whole day focused on red zone that's how he would install it with 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 his teams and things like that and and i would and my role for for him is you know I get all my film off NFL Game Pass wherever we can find it online and, and I try to scout the opponent the individuals so as his his team is putting in the plays and things like that I'm looking at the matchup so Julian Brents number 29 the the corner for the Colts how what type of press coverage does he play what type of releases make him vulnerable what plays into his strengths uh, how you know what is the the rhythm and the plan of attack for him versus you know their opposite corner versus the nickel who might play you in the slot versus the linebacker who might line up on you and empty like trying to look at all these different situations and I try to come in and give him a picture for the the individual traits of each guy and and the way to take it to to win that individual matchup and then he kind of applies that to everything he's doing with his coaches as far as the game planning and things like that so but but you know on days we'd like to get kind of situational and look at each sort of sort of situation for itself and each nuance for itself we got to do everything basically in one or two days right so like monday we kind of get the overall picture for the saints and then we have one day on tuesday to to really look at them situationally and 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 create plans for each route that he's going to be asked to run on on thursday uh we really have to do that in 24 to 36 hours to the point where like him and i usually you know we talk saturday night that's the last time we kind of have a game planning type football related conversation um, you know, we were talking as as early as like noon today or even like one or two o'clock, just like after he had finished things with his team, we're talking about little mindset things, things he wants to be focused on, some of the other factors surrounding the game that we want to make sure we have solutions for. And then obviously we're talking about any last minute matchup notes and things like that. But it really is, it feels like cramming for a test. If you've, if you've ever gone into a test where you started studying late or maybe didn't study at all and, and the day of the test, you're not really sure if you know all the answers and you're still looking over the answer sheet as you're walking into the building. That's kind of like what Thursday night football is. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not your normal week of preparation. It's not your normal week to, to recover physically. And you're kind of going into it, just figuring out the, ans- the answers as you prepare yourself, um, rather than being able to do one than the other. And, and it's really a week where, like, you got to love football. I think, I think if you love football, it's something you're excited about. It's prime time. You know, everyone's watching. And you're able to mentally trick yourself into uh, ignoring any of the, 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 the hard parts about the week, about you know overcoming the physical part, the short week of preparation. You're so excited about the opportunity and not to mention the, the, the mini bye week that comes after, which a lot of players are definitely excited for. Like you get, 
you get some time off afterwards. That kind of drives you into like forgetting the the pain and you know the just the stress of preparing on a short week and and putting your all into it. And then you know you go win a game in New Orleans and, and win your fourth game in a row, and you know that reward speaks for itself. So we had no problem on the on the motivational end because Evan loves football. Evan loves what he does. Evan is a master of his craft, working to be a master of his craft, and and just really really like loves what he does. So it's no problem getting a guy like Evan prepared. But but sometimes. You know, for, for someone where it's not going as well or it doesn't feel as good, like that can be it can be kind of kind of difficult getting yourself ready for a Thursday night game. Um, but definitely excited to see Evan prepare. Definitely excited. We had some success on Thursday night last week, last year versus the Jets. He went for 100 yards back in MetLife, and we prepared on a short week. So, you know, hoping we improve that blueprint this week. We got him even better prepared for this one, and, and he can have a similar similar outcome and and give the Jags you know a boost for a big win. Uh, the next guy we want to talk about the next sideline hustle family member, top Week Six performer. Uh, Jacoby Myers, and and this one was was a fun week. It was a, a what everyone deemed as the revenge game for Kobe, but definitely not how he saw it. But he got to play his former team in the New England Patriots. And Kobe, this is my second or third year working full time with Kobe. I actually met him four or five years ago when he was in year two. I was up in New England training with Mosa New, and I just met Kobe on a field one day, and I remember that session very vividly. Now that I'm working with him full time, um, but he was like a very you know he, Kobe has a very unique style to himself. Kobe's a very stoic kid. Very calm kid, um, very, very even keeled. Um, and he's really taught himself everything to this point. He's an undrafted free agent. He was a quarterback in college. So he's really kind of taught himself how to play the position, taught himself his own mindset, taught himself his own work ethic, and really come from nothing to, to be here to where he just earned a three-year, $33 million contract. And, he, and he's really playing like a true number one receiver right now with, with some of the things he's doing for the Raiders. Uh, so, you know, he, he's, he's a real stoic, calm kid, who has a really good handle of himself because of where he's come from. He really understands himself. He's very self-aware. And I, I say that because it was a different week this week. Like, it was, it was an exciting week. It, it, he definitely didn't look at it as any, like, revenge week. Although I will say you can't ignore the fact that, the, you know, the Patriots are the team that gave him his first opportunity. He loved New England. He loved his time in New England. And they didn't really offer him a competitive contract to what everyone else in the market was offering him. And, and then, you know, went out and got Juju and, and offered him something similar. So basically chose another player over him is how it could be perceived. Uh, I never really, like Kobe never necessarily told me that he feels that way, but like it can't be ignored that this is your former team. They signed someone else to a similar contract over you. And here you are over in Vegas because, you know, you would have entertained an offer going back there and that wasn't even necessarily on the table. So there's a little bit of that, that personal side to it. But really, when I talked to Kobe, it was just excitement. Like, he was just so excited to see his boys, so excited to play against his boys. When you watch the film, this man is dapping someone up after every game, after every play, smiling. He was just a kid having fun out there. And, and that, that was really, that was just really cool to see. I asked him how it felt. He's like, bro, it felt like a really intense practice. Because he's like, yo, you know how we practice up there. Like, New England, we practice so intensely. And I see these boys so much. Like, it felt like a super intense practice. Like, it was so slow. It was, it was calm for me. Like, you know, it was, it was really cool to hear his perspective of it and hear kind of his, his joy for the game pour through uh, as he was talking about the matchup versus former team. But uh, definitely an exciting one and one that, you know, we talked about some of the, 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 the emotional things he might be dealing with. We, we, we visualized some different scenarios of, you know, what if, you, what if you're not playing well and you don't have any targets through the first half and you're pressing to have targets against your former team. Uh, what is that going to feel like? Are you going to feel a certain type of way? What if you start playing great, you know, which he did. He got off to a great start. What if you start playing great and you're hot right away? How are you going to keep that going and, and and not get too high and not get too emotional and stay even keeled so you can keep producing the whole game? Like we talked through some of those scenarios just to make sure the boxes were checked. But honestly, I don't really think it was a week where he needed, like, I don't think it affected him a time. I think he, I don't want to say it didn't affect him, but I think that he had a great plan for himself and he had a great internal dialogue. Um, and, and like he's, like I told you, he just told me he was, he was very excited, but we'll go through some of the clips. He really, he really played great. Um, just did a lot of, a lot of little things. Well, uh, a big plan that we wanted versus these guys, they're a little bit beat up in the secondary. You know, they got uh, a guy, Jonathan Jones, who I really respect, who trains with us in the off season, who a uh, really quick, fast guy, JC Jackson, they just signed. They had some other guys hurt, you know, their rookie corner got hurt. So a big thing for us was like just playing fast, like everything full speed. And anyone who knows and has scouted New England knows like they just play an over the top style of defense and press coverage. They like to play, they like to motor mirror and play soft inch back press coverage and stay over the top. Uh, in 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 loose coverage, they're very they get a lot of depth. They 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 inch back over the top. So a lot of it was just like play full speed, use great body language as we call it, making every route look like a go ball, full stride, and just hit your brakes fearlessly. Um, and really win in the break area. If, if, you, if you run full speed, you'll push them off and create space for yourself. 
Um, and he really did a great job of that. He attacked that game plan all day. Obviously, there were some other nuances, but that's, you know, that's, that's how I'll put it for you guys. And the first route here against Jonathan Jones, he had, he had a great, uh, like, 10, 12-yard speed out, third inside step. You look at the speed cut. This is something we've been working on a lot. You look at the speed cut. This is something we've been working on a lot. Um, it's just kind of full speed body language. Full speed body language. Um, hold on, let me uh, collect myself right quick. You look at the speed cut here. This is something we've been working on. We work on a lot. It's just our ability to hit this at full speed and come friendly within a yard or two. All right. He's, he's attacking JJ with full stride. You can see him really open it up off the ball. Those first two or three steps out off the ball. Lions demeanor. Just about at the top, you get JJ to kind of to kind of break his cushion and start to, to to open up his hips and turn. And that's right when when Kobe's hitting the speed cut, and you see the speed cut pushing off that pressure step. We don't want to slam down. We're not dropping our hips. We're not slamming our weight. We're pushing off. We want to accelerate through this cut. And Kobe does a great job pushing off, running through the cut, accelerating to the sideline. Maybe a little bit more of a yak opportunity there, um, which is something I got on him about in the self scout, where I feel like he could probably catch. And go get vertical right away and steal four or five yards. I also feel like there's enough space where maybe he could stick his foot in the ground and go out the back door. But nonetheless, just trying to maximize these opportunities, have that urgency in the yak game. But a good way to start it off. I know that felt good for him, just having that first catch, um, and you know, just, just get him rolling. And there's also that that part of of the game, which is this is an emotional game for you. This is your former team, and and it feels good to catch the first one because there was that mental scenario of. What if, you know, what if I'm not playing to my standard at a certain point in the game? Am I going to start pressing? So you, it's good to get that first one early. Shout out to Jimmy and the Raiders for kind of recognizing that and get, getting him going early. Um, then we got a third down hitch route. Thought this was great. Look at his body language again. Full stride off the ball. That's going to push the DB back. That's going to give all the indicators we need to create that separation just based on their play style. And then Kobe catches the hitch high and outside, or with a high and outside throw. And the big thing we talk about here, back to the basket yak, right? Like, he doesn't have the opportunity to face the defender. So the first thing we have to do is just get our feet in the ground. We can't do anything, even if this is a high ball, we can't do anything. When we can't see the defender, we can't make a move until we have our feet in the ground. So a really great job from Kobe here, running the full stride hitch, and then getting his feet in the ground right away. And that's what allows him to kind of spin off this tackle and then fight forward and fall for the first down. It's little things, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's little extra effort, but that shit matters. That shit really, really matters when it comes to like picking up first downs, moving the chains. Um, so something we talk about a lot. We do a lot of yak drills of catching different footballs, getting those feet in the ground, making that first move. He doesn't necessarily make the first man miss, but he also does enough where he's not stopped short of the sticks and, and he, he earns the first down, which is going to set up the next play, which was, which was really awesome. Um, kind of turn up the sound for this and let you all just hear it for yourself. The thing I enjoyed about this, when you watch, we'll talk about the route in a sec, but you just watch the, uh, his celebration, and uh, you just know that that roar, looking up at the sky, letting it all out, came from a, he's a kid, man, like, all these dudes are, are kids, they're people, you know what I'm saying, like, anytime, it's like, it's like a relationship, anytime your ex tells you they don't want you, it hurts, no matter what you want to say, whether he ended up in a better situation in Vegas, whether he's happy with his contract, whether, like, whether he admits it, whether he tells me it's fucking human nature. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, it never feels good when an ex doesn't want you. And that's basically what happened in free agency. That makes you deal with some self-doubt. It makes you question the work you've done there. It makes you question, you know, do people see me the way I see myself? All those sorts of things that Kobe being a stoic, self-aware kid, he handled it well, but it's not like it wasn't real. So now to come out on the first drive, you have two or three catches, you move the chains, and then you run a perfect route. You attack 27 the exact way we, we, we kind of game plan attacking him, and you score a touchdown. Like, you just got to feel good for the kid. You know what I'm saying? Take football aside for a second. Like, what a cool moment to, to help prepare him for and to, and to be a part of. That's like, bro, you got to, you know, you got to face the music against your former team and respond. We had a situation like that last year with, the, you know, with Evan playing the Giants. And, and just like those things matter. And, and next week we got... You know, we got A-Rob coming up playing the Rams again. It's just like, like those, there are human elements to this that like, these guys aren't machines. Like those are things that in my role, we have to prepare for. That's probably like, fuck the film study and all this stuff, which I think is, is crazy important. The most valuable work I provide is, is that sort of work of like dealing with these mental, I, we were just watching a Kobe clip today, which where he was talking about a teammate came up to him and said, uh, and said, Kobe, I just want to, I just want to feel like I matter to you as a teammate. And that was confusing to Kobe. He's like, of course you matter. But then he had to break that down. And he's like, wow, being a champion and being a leader is understanding that there are these like emotional undertones, these emotional side stories for every guy. And, and 
getting them to reach their full potential is is dealing with those side stories and and kind of you know managing them. So for me as a coach, getting to all my guys to their full potential, those those side stories matter. Those narratives matter. Uh, so for Kobe, this was a big one, bro. And like you know, going back and playing great against your former team, and and kind of putting that monkey behind your back now of did they want me? Did they not? Like fuck it, because you just beat their asses and and scored and scored the first touchdown and went for five catches for sixty one yards. So like it's it's just like that's a cool part. That's one of the coolest parts about my job is is realizing the human elements to each one of my clients, realizing kind of their insecurities, their fears, their doubts, and helping them navigate that and play with a free mind. And the fact that Kobe could go out there and say it felt like practice and he had a clear mind is is a huge, you know, makes me feel awesome about the work. Like him feeling prepared against a DB is one thing. He's been de- beating DBs before he ever met me. Him feeling mentally secure and at peace and ready to go be a fucking killer on, in, in, in what should be an emotionally charged game, that's really where I feel like the value of our relationship shines through more than anything. And, and that was a pretty cool thing to be a part of. But talking about the route, just doing a really good job attacking 27, uh, attacking his outside shoulder, attacking outside his framework. 27 is a guy who plays over the top of everything. And then Kobe hit a great uh, little rocker step at the top. He hit the 1-2 shift and almost dropped 2-7 and, and hit the solo catch in the back of the end zone. Really great moment for Kobe. Um, ended up having a few more catches. Um, this is actually a really one of his best yak clips of the year right here. And we'll, we'll end on this one for him. But catching this little uh, deep OTB right here, search route. And catching the ball right before this backside safety comes to close on him and hits the drop step on the move, which was dope. Only results in like five or six more yards. But these are things we work on a lot and pride ourselves on are, you know, not letting your feet stop at the catch. So you can see as he's catching it, he's pushing himself downfield as he's catching. He's not catching it, stopping, then pushing himself downfield. It's all happening in one smooth motion, which we call a drop step. So hitting this drop step to gain five or six extra yards was a play I was really proud of. Uh, then he hit this deep dig where you just look at his body language, full stride, and hits a two-step break at the top, which Kobe admittedly is not the fastest guy. He doesn't run a 4-3. But part of the way you make up for not being a 4-3 guy is being really efficient in the break area. And like getting out in two steps on an 18-yard dig is pretty damn impressive. So hell of a day for, for Kobe. He really carried the team uh, as far as him and, him and the tight end played great and played consistent all day. Um, but, but, you know, Kobe's been, been handling a, a pretty big workload there and, and handling it well. And I'm just really proud to see him... Uh, just grow into his own handle, you know, the, the move to a new city, all, all these kind of factors we dealt with. He's starting to just like put those on the other side of him and just get back to playing football. And I think this is probably another one of those, you know, like you just beat your former team and you knew you had that one circle. Let's go fucking play football now and go win as many games as possible and go chase a thousand yards, 1500 yards and go see how good we can be. So I think a, a, a cool moment for Kobe. Definitely glad it's behind us. Glad we can move on and, and, and focus on, uh, on what's ahead. All right, another Sideline Hustle family member with a strong performance in week six, Darius Slayton of the New York Giants. And, you know, they've been struggling over there. Obviously, there was the well-documented kind of blunder at the end of the first half, letting the clock run down, not kick a field goal. Um, But, you know, I I really feel proud of the way Slay's playing. When you really look at Slay's targets, his body of work, the opportunities he's been given, uh, PFF had some study of of receivers that have created the most separation in the NFL. Tyreek Hill was number one. Brandon Ayuk was number two. Darius Slayton was number three. And like, when you watch the film, it speaks to that. And like, for, that's really the way I see Slay. Like Slay has had trouble with drops over the last few years. I, we've done a lot of, you know, pretty well documented work on fixing the drop problem, really making his hand catching more consistent, uh, making his hand placement more consistent, his confidence that's shown up on film. Uh, he's made some good hands catch, made a great hands catch to win the game versus Arizona to seal the game and put them in field goal range, has made a, a couple of really good over-the-shoulder tough catches. Um, I, I feel like a lot of the work has shown up, and his his film is really strong. Uh, he, he's being a little bit of a victim of circumstances right now, just trying to get this thing back on the right track. I mean, they've they've had so many crazy things thrown at them as far as injuries, strugg- early season struggles. Like, they were a, a playoff team last year, you know what I'm saying? Um, and I think the thing I've really been, been ha- you know, trying to push Slay on is just, owning every aspect of this. Like, he chose to come back here in free agency. He's been a New York Giant his whole life. He loves it here. He wants to retire here. So, like, own this shit. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's not just like, oh, I did my job. I'm getting open. Like, that's that. Like, no, like, bring the young guys along. Do whatever you can to help DJ. Work with the coaches to, to find things that are going to work. Like, really don't, like, obviously you came into the season thinking you were going to be back in the playoffs competing for a Super Bowl. It's not looking like that's going to be overly possible right now, but that can't change our approach. And I think, like, that's really these sorts of situations are where I really feel like our work comes into play because, you know, similar to Kobe dealing with some of the outside noise, like keeping these guys level headed and keeping their performance at a high level when 
you know, like, you know, you're playing the Buffalo Bills and on paper, they're outmatched, but those boys came ready to play. Tyrod gave them some juice and, and gave the receivers some opportunities, but I really appreciated the way Slay came out and set the tone. He had a big play right away. He blocked his ass off all day. Um, and he's just doing a lot of work behind the scenes, just trying to, you know, build confidence in a young receiver group, a lot of new faces. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud of what he's doing. There's, a, there's, I have a, I have very high expectations for him. And I also, you know, look at him in a very high light. I think that he's, He's a really good player, and the film speaks to it, and some of the, the hidden numbers speak to it. I'm just hoping they can get this thing rolling so he can really, really show that. But let, let's look at his first uh, slot fade, his first big play of the game. Uh, he had 24 in the slot. 24 is a flat-footed press corner. So his first step, 24's first step, he's a lateral read step guy, right? So he's going to take this lateral step and then throw hands. So the thing that me and Slate talked about all day versus him was having proactive hands, like getting to a spot, beating him with your feet, and then when you beat him with your feet, you know the hands are coming, and you got to be proactive to get those hands off. So Slay does a great job here, kind of beating him with width, winning on the, on the hezzy to slide release. Uh, he gets outside those hands, but he knows the hands are coming. He's hitting with, him the, with the shoulder dip, and he's got, you know, he, he's got his kind of arm bar out there, not letting 24 get close. But then really where Slay wins this route is, is the secondary hands right here to get those hands off. Most receivers at this point would, would, get, would get to the edge, and he, they feel like they just have to run with speed. And this, this, receive, this DB is able to slow him down a little bit or grab on him by, by holding on to that shoulder. And we got it. We can't let DBs touch us. It's been a big focus for Slay. Slay's a 4-3-40 guy. He stops better as well as anyone in the NFL. He's got, you know, he's got great breaking ability, um, and, and he runs fast. But you are able to allow DBs to slow you down and take away from your natural speed when you let them you know, put hands all over you and, and slow you down with physicality. So a big key to Slay's game and continuing to grow is not allowing these DBs to get close to him and getting these hands off. So a great example of that right here, um, you know, getting the hands off, creating separation. Tyrod, you know, throws a great ball, dropping it in there on the over the shoulder. And, and this was, you know, the first big play of the game. It got them down in field goal range. I think they kicked the field goal this drive. And, and you know, it's one of those things where if, if we are going to take on more ownership as a leader and take on more ownership of, of being responsible for our guys and trying to elevate the room. Like when your number's called, you got to make big fucking plays. And if, and if we're going to have the audacity to, to continue to work with the quarterbacks and the coaches to, to try and, you know, fight for more targets, you, you better show up when, when your number's called. And I really feel proud of the way Slay has done that this year in, in most of the opportunities he's been given. Um, and then we had another one of these later in the, later in the fourth quarter, they had some success, or I think it was maybe the third quarter, but they had some, uh, they had some success with this slot fade, this, this empty slot fade, uh, Sort of, sort of play that they had going. They had some different plays on the, on the backside, but essentially giving Slay a one-on-one -on -one matchup when, when they got single high coverage to go beat one of the corners and give him the whole field to, to kind of win on the go ball. This one, 47, was a little bit of a looser corner, so Slay's eating up space a little bit more. He's attacking him a little bit more off the, off the line and just throwing that, you know, Slay knows he's fast. He knows he has the whole speed. I mean, has the whole field and wants to use his speed, so he doesn't have to do too much of the line. He's got to get him to stop his feet get to a place where then he can win a foot race and he has, you know, 30, 40 yards to win that race. He can do that every time. So it's a good job squaring him up, gaining ground a little bit, giving a quick one-two to kind of hold him and get him to shift his hips slightly. And now it's off to the races and Slay's winning with speed. This time, 47 can't even get close to him just because Slay kind of has that advantageous position. He does a great job pushing off that inside leg. If you really see Slay's inside leg right here, he goes, he goes left, right, that inside right leg. He creates a lot of power off that. And he's kind of, at that point, it's over. 47's tripping. Another great ball from Tyrod. Really good job from Slay having field awareness. High hands. Catching the ball. High hands. Getting those feet down right away. Protecting the football. Great job along the sideline. So, you know, Slay had a couple other underneath catches. He made some big plays. Got them in field goal range. And, again, you look at the body of work. He, he, had, a, he had a couple game ceiling catches against Arizona. Played really well in a game they were competitive in. Uh, beat Steph Gilmore a couple times on slants. Beat uh, Xavier Howard a couple times on slants. He just not... You know, it's hard for him to put things together. He's not getting a ton of opportunities. But I think that as those opportunities come, he's going to prove who he is. And I think with the typical volume of a number one receiver, you know, 8 to 10 to 12 targets a game, I think Slay's ready to do some crazy shit with that. And now it's just up to him to kind of own the adversity that everyone's going through and, and find a way to uncover those targets, not selfishly, because, like, that's what's going to help the team win. He's their best offensive – he's their best receiver. And he's, he's, he's going he's gonna to prove that and make that undeniable by the time the year's over. Um, and then we had this fourth quarter play. You know what I'm saying? It was a, it was a corner pump. Um, you know, kind of trying to, trying to create a big play at the end of the game. Corner pump, difficult route, but does a great job kind of selling the corner here, getting on 47's toes. And really, this is a body positioning drill, right? Whenever we have these deep competitive balls, it's not even like a speed drill, especially when you got the safety up there. You're thinking like, I need to create good body position so that I can go up and get the ball 
from a strong point, right? So I can so I can go up from a powerful point and elevate and catch the ball over this guy. And I thought Slade did a pretty good job of all that. You know what I'm saying? Like at the end of the day, right, when when all we're taking is big shots, this is like, you know, we're taking a, a, a 30-foot three-pointer. Like if that's what you're going to major in, you're going to miss some shots. And so we, 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 hit, we hit on two of them. And, and this is the biggest one. This is one we have to have, the standard we hold ourselves to. Like there's no excuse but we also have to like not let it be more than it is. Like it's, it was a big play in the game, but it's it's one big shot that we didn't connect on, and uh, you know that that that's gonna happen at times. But I think you know when you really look at it, like Slate got himself in good position. The ball's a little bit behind him, but he gets his hands on it. Right, the thing he needs to do here, he lets it get into his body a little bit. It would be nice to either have his hands a little tighter at the catch point and really go extend and go pluck it. But just understand like kind of what the like that would be a, a, an incredible catch, and that's the standard I hold him to. He should hold himself to that. He does. Like, this is this is one that we feel like we should have. The way he put it to me, he's like, you know, looking back at it, me and Tyrod talk about it. It's like, this is one I should have, and this one he feels like he wishes he led me a little bit more over the outside shoulder. Like, it could all be a little bit more perfect. But at the end of the day, all we can ask for is that we have a chance to put our hands on it and go make a play, and we got to hold ourselves to where we got to come down with this. We got to find a way to come down with this. We'll continue to drill this. Um, but it's also one where it's like, you know, good things are happening right now, giving Darius Slayton a chance to make plays on the ball. Um, I think that's evident in the deep balls. Again, he's had, he's had success catching these. A few of them have been thrown a little wide. Um, but just giving him a chance to get his hands on it, I think, uh, I think good things are going to happen here. And he's got to continue to do a better job. This is, this is something in his career that needs to continue to get better is these 50-50 balls jumping from a powerful place and not fading away at the catch point, being able to jump up and through him a little bit more and, and maybe turn his body and go square the ball up. I don't know if that's really possible here just because of the ball placement. Like, it's pretty hard to go square the ball up with it behind you right there. But at least trying to get a little bit more power and momentum up to the ball, getting our hands on it rather than letting it get to our chest. But, you know, we're going to live with these. We're going to live with these because they're high degree of difficulty. They're spectacular plays. We expect to make them. But it's also one of those things where we just got to analyze it, learn from it, get better from it, and, and move on. And what we really want to fight for is just more opportunities. Like, you know, two for three. Let's go three for four. Let's go four for five. Like, he's going to make the next one. And I think he's proven that at this point. They just got to find a way to, to continue to, to trust him and, and, and build that rapport with whoever the signal caller is going to be. And, and, you know, he's got to do his work on the back end. But I'm excited for Slay. I also think Slay has done a great job after the catch this year. And that's, that's just something that, like, you know, I wanted to point out. There's this play from, from the, the uh, Dolphins last week. And this was just one of, like, a play that I'm proud of because it's, it's a few things we work on a lot. A, not letting the ball get into his body, catching extended with his hands. You know what I'm saying? Look at his eyes to his hands right here, stopping the football as it touches his hands. And then getting right to full speed and becoming a, a, a runner with the football and making plays with the ball in his hands. Like, I just think that, that he's put a lot of really good stuff on film. I'm, I'm proud of the way that he's competing. This play was late in the game of a 15-point game. You know what I'm saying? He had, he had a big catch at the end of the San Francisco game, getting chippy with, with, with seven, uh, and, and had a big play, a post-curl. Like, I'm, I'm proud of the way he's been competing at the end of these games, some of these games that have been lopsided. And you see his energy, you see his leadership, you see his focus during these games, and like, from my perspective, that's all we can ask for. You know what I'm saying? All we can really ask for is, like, do what, do the best you can with the opportunities given to you and, like, stay fucking locked in and keep pushing your guys and, like, don't allow the circumstances to determine, like, how you're going to work and how you're going to show up and compete for yourself. And, and again, I think uh, I think this kid is eventually going to, to, to show who he is once these things start clicking, and, and I'm excited to see it. So that's, that's mostly a wrap for our, our Week 6 update. We got, uh, we got one special feature, my boy D-Bell. They won a huge game for the Browns. Um, and, and then I got to talk about my dog, Christian Dremel. But those are, those are kind of the major big performances. I wanted to shout out my dog, D-Bell. Uh, he had a couple clutch plays here. Um, the, the, the Browns, I think, in a, lot of, in a lot of people's eyes, upset the, the 49ers, even though the Browns are a very good team. But they didn't have Deshaun. They didn't have their starting quarterback. And this was a big play in the game, this toss play to the outside here. And my dog, D-Bell, got a pancake on Fred Warner, which, you know, Fred's a little off balance. Don't get me wrong. He's spinning. But my dog, D-Bell, mixing it up. You see him right here on the edge. Seal on the edge versus, versus Warner. Warner's trying to blitz. He spins off of it. And my dog D running his feet. Got a pancake on Fred Warner. Led to a touchdown. I know that was one that he's excited about. Something we've been priding ourselves on. D is, you know, the, third, the fourth, fifth receiver for the Browns. So, like, a lot of the work he does is that gritty, dirty work. And, like, if we're serious about winning. We got to be, we got to take pride in that shit. And, uh, you know, there was, there were some lapses in the run game early in the season. And, and now you see the shit he's putting on film. He's doing a great job kind of making his, his physical presence felt. So, a great play there lead to a touchdown, and then, you know, later on in the fourth quarter, it was fourth down, they're driving to, to take the lead here, and they go to empty, and he, he wasn't playing a lot at this point, it's not like he was in the game and in rhythm, he had to come cold off the bench, they put him in empty, he's running the stick versus cover two, 
does a good job having field awareness. You see his eyes kind of working both sides, settles in the, in the void, settles in the zone, and then actually comes back to get the ball and then drop steps through contact to get the first down. And, and I talked to him about it. The reason why he came back to get the ball is like the, his first target of the game was, was a pick from Fred Warner. Fred Warner jumped the spot route. It was thrown kind of late, and he picked it. So, so D smartly felt you know that guy closing on him again, stepped to go meet the ball, but now he's short of the down marker and has awareness of it and is able to get his feet in the ground, use his strength and lunge forward and convert on fourth down. So like a big time play. And like, these are the things that, you know, not all the guys we work with have these big time starting roles, getting eight to 10 targets. And the way you earn those targets is maximizing the role that you're given now. So things like this go a long way. Having a pancake block, one of the best linebackers in the league, converting on fourth down. Like this shows coaches and franchises around the league that you can be trusted in big moments. So whether it's with Cleveland, like you don't know, the, the league's fucking crazy. It could be Cleveland, could be somewhere else. Like you're putting a good body of work on film to prove that, you know, you're reliable, you're a reliable playmaker in this league. And, you know, there's a role for you on, on, on teams. And, and then once you establish yourself, you can get rolling. Like, that's just how this shit works. You know, when you're trying to build a, a, a career for yourself from the ground up. So great job from Deke showing up in some clutch moments. I'm proud of him. He got to continue to make plays and make his presence felt. Um, and that's a wrap. Can't leave without shouting out my dog, Christian Dremel. Um, I'm going to let Rutgers keep doing the speaking for my boy. They've been going crazy on telling the Christian Dremel story, but... Anyone who's been a longtime follower of the Sideline Hustle remembers Drem, uh, the little white kid I've been coaching since he was like 15, 16 years old, used to be short striding everything and, and fucking rolling on top of himself. And now he's, uh, he's, starting at, he's starting at Rutgers, leading the team in receiving receptions, yards, touchdowns, um, just had six catches, 80 yards against Michigan State. Um, but this is a kid who, you know, turned down D1 AA scholarships to walk on at Rutgers, bet on himself, earned a scholarship. Now he's starting. Now he's got, you know, meetings with NFL scouts set up. It's like a, it's a cool, one of the cooler homegrown stories. The kid who went to Don Bosco, I've coached since literally he was 15, 16 years old. And Dremel reminded me the other day that I actually met him for the first time at a Boston college camp when I was coaching at Wesleyan and tried to recruit him D3. And he was like, yeah, nah, I'm good on that. And, and you know, he's this little like five, eight white kids. So I'm like, he's a perfect fit for a high academic D3 school. Like this is, this is the type of kid. And he, uh, and he was like, nah, I got bigger dreams. And next thing you know, a kid's uh starting at Rutgers and, and making noise in the Big Ten. So shout out to Dram. Shout out, shout out to the Sideline Hustle family. Uh, it's game day. We got Evan Ingram coming on here Thursday Night Football in a little bit. Catch up with you guys next week for week seven. Peace. From the sidelines, we got to hustle because we got to eat. From the sidelines, we got some goals that we still got to reach. 